speaking to order, I'd like to ask everyone to uh, rise for a moment of reflection, followed by a pledge to the flag. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Oh. Through the window. We have a uh, agenda that's been published and presented for adoption. Do I have a mo motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Is Ms. there Johnson. a second? Thank you, Reverend Newbill. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Turn to uh, Mr. Zahn, our Managing Director and CEO for the Safety Briefing. Thank you, Chairman. Safety is a core value of JEA. Uh, in the event of emergency, uh, who's going to call 911? Ted Optin, thank you very much. Uh, who's going <laughs> to uh, do CPR? Uh, Melissa Dykes. Um, in the event that we need to evacuate, please identify the person to your right as your safety buddy. Make your way uh, calmly and, but efficiently down the uh, stairway to the left of the elevators out to the southeast corner of Church and Main. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Turn to uh, Jody Brooks, our Vice President, Chief Legal Officer for the Sunshine Law Public Records Statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a duly noticed public meeting <coughs> in which minutes will be taken. We have quorum present in the room. We're in good order to proceed. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. Were there any uh, comments from the public? I don't have any low cards. Wow, shocking. Uh, and then I'll turn to our, our council liaison, uh, Councilman Schellenberg. Ms. Schellenberg. Thank you very much, Chair. I just want to thank... Uh, Aaron Zahn and Ryan Watermaker, we, we met in my office. I had a couple questions. We had a great discussion, and I hope to have future discussions with both of them in the future as things come up. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Councilman. We'll turn to uh, Roman numeral three on the agenda for operations. Uh, our first item is the consent agenda. Uh, have a motion for adoption of the uh, consent agenda as presented. So moved. Thank you. Second. Uh, second. second. Reverend Newbill. Thank you, Ms. Green. Mr. Uh, Reverend Newbill. Uh, all in favor of uh, adoption of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries unanimously. Uh, and then I'd recognize Ms. Dykes for our dashboard. She's just flying along. This is a good meeting. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are behind tab 3B uh, for the dashboard, and I'll do a brief recap of operational performance for the first quarter of this fiscal year. Uh, so I'll just focus on not every individual line item, but just some highlights from the performance scorecard. Uh, earlier this month, we received the first wave of the J.D. Power residential results. Um, and I am pleased to report that JEA is now back in the first quartile for residential customer satisfaction. So we're now in the first quartile for both residential and business. Um, that puts us on track to meet our residential goal, um, still lagging behind our top decile goal that we set for ourselves on commercial. Um, but more to come in future wave reporting for both of those. <coughs> Our grid performance is outstanding in both systems. Uh, we're exceeding our goals for the year. Um, and this is in spite of some of the third party contractor challenges that we talked about at the last um, board meeting. I did just want to flag behind tab 3A um, in, in uh, the consent agenda. Um, item F is a follow up memo to our discussion last month, which talks about some of the challenges we've had with third party contractor just damaging our equipment and then goes through what we're doing to help prevent those in the future, including a, a new partnership that we formed with JSO on the enforcement side and some legislative initiatives to try to change some of the rules around that. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions on that memo at your convenience. Um, in the area of financial value, um, generation fleet reliability is included as a financial metric because if our fleet is performing reliably, it allows us to optimize our fuel spend. Um, at JEA. And so I do want to flag one metric that is lagging behind in terms of performance this year, and that is the generating fleet reliability. And it's because of one particular unit. Um, but Northside, uh, Northside Unit 2 um, has been experiencing operational issues for the past couple of months. Now, the good news is we have all three Northside units on, and they've been on over the weekend. Um, but Northside 2 is uh, still not operating at full capacity. So we'll continue to work through the operational issues that we've had there. Um, and hopefully see some per, some improvement in that the um, that metric going forward. And I'll report back to the board on that next month, um, and hopefully a, on a successful resolution of that issue. Um, under the community impact value, uh, we continue to stress safety as a core value at JEA. 
And while our safety performance has improved year over year, um, we are still lagging behind our 1.2 uh, recordable incident rate goal that we've set for ourselves for this year. Um, so we'll continue to emphasize the importance of safety as a goal and a metric for us. In environmental value, uh, we continue the outstanding performance on nitrogen. And again, this is in spite of some uh, construction that's upcoming at Buckman, uh, which would have the effect of increasing our nitrogen to the river. Because of some of the creative changes that you've heard about directly from our employees through a video two months ago, um, our nitrogen performance for the year is, uh, is excellent and is expected to remain excellent. Um, one place where we're having, um, at, we, will, we'll, we will have a challenge in meeting our goal for the year is on sanitary sewer overflows. We track in SSOs both the number of incidents and the total volume uh, that results from that, those incidents. And for each and every incident that occurs, we do a root cause analysis and, um, and looking for ways that we can improve our system and the reliability of our system. Um, unfortunately, the root cause analysis of analyses of the SSOs this year have revealed no common effects or no common causes. Um, they've just been kind of all over the place. Um, there is one bit of good news, though. Um, we don't show total volume on this uh, dashboard, um, but total volume in terms of impact on the environment is down almost 90% versus last year. So even though we're having a higher number of incidents um, and a higher number of incidents per mile, which is the rate that you see on the dashboard that's here, uh, the impact on the environment is far less in terms of volume than it's been in year years past. So not all bad news. Um, last month, we talked about some concerns around the fuel fund. Um, and in particular, we were projecting a fuel fund balance below our target for this year, and we're concerned going into the winter months um, about degradation in their balance that might cause us to have to revisit our fuel rate. Um, I am happy to report that because of the mild weather that we've had over the past month, our fuel fund balance, the, the uh, target balance or the projected balance for this year has actually increased about $15 million since last month. Um, so we think we'll end the year now close to $50 million um, in that fund, and that's projected to increase over the coming years. So there's no uh, rate changes that are recommended at this point. Um, it is something we will continue to, to watch very closely, though. Um, any questions on any of the metrics on our dashboard? Okay. Any questions, Ms. Johnson? No. Nope. Right. No. <coughs> hey, I have a quick question. I, I, I noticed um, a couple of days ago when I was reviewing this, the water and sewer, water sales down, sewer sales up. I thought that those sort of tracked in unison. Do they often diverge? They really don't often diverge. And it's, a, it's interesting you asked that question because it's one that we asked um, recently in an operations meeting. Um, we think what might be driving that differential is um, an increase in the number of sewer customers um, that are coming on and connecting to the sewer system, customers who are already water customers. But it's something we'll, we'll continue to watch because it it's not an intuitive direction. Right. Struck me as odd. Okay. Any other questions on the dashboard? Thank you, Ms. Dyke. Okay. Thank you. For that. Chair recognizes Ms. Kilgo. I think you're driving an audience for us here today, Ms. Kilgo. <laughs> Corporate headquarters update. Thank you. Let me just, before Ms. Kilgo gets started, uh, for the board, this is an information presentation uh, because we're still in our procurement uh, process period. Um, I'll ask the board to refrain from uh, questions and discussion at this part, or at this point uh, in the process. Um, I'll also uh, just go ahead and announce that um, after some uh, consultation with, uh, with Mr. Zahn and Ms. Kilgo, uh, we're going to change a little bit the uh, process that was previously announced uh, regarding the uh, corporate headquarters decision uh, making timeline. So we're still going to have the February 5 uh, workshop. Uh, but what, what I've asked is that in order to provide the greatest transparency possible uh, and to provide some information to the public uh, in advance of that February 5 hearing, uh, Ms. Uh, Kilgo and her staff, uh, together with our outside consult consultant CBRE, um, are going to present a short list today uh, of three uh, bidders from the six that submitted packages. And we're going to go back to those three and ask that they put together a package that is a publicly available document. Uh, they were not previously advised that their current packages would be publicly available. Uh, so we want to give them the opportunity to redact uh, information from that that they may not want to be publicly available. As many of you know, as part of our procurement process, we typically don't share bids uh, from competing bidders with one another while we're in the procurement process. So. 
uh, we're going to ask them to, uh, to shortlist bidders to put together a package that we will make publicly available in advance of the February 5 uh, workshop of the board. Um, it's actually a board meeting. Um, and then we will have a public comment period uh, at the beginning of that meeting uh, so that the public will have an opportunity <coughs> to see the packages from the three uh, shortlist bidders. They'll have an opportunity to make comments to this board about those three shortlist bidders before we actually hear from the bidders themselves who will make presentations at that February 5 uh, meeting. The board will receive uh, complete packages uh, and we will review those at that meeting. We will get input uh, from Ms. Kilgo, Mr. McCarthy and their staff uh, and from our outside consultants uh, and then we'll have an opportunity to make a decision at that February 5 meeting regarding the corporate uh, headquarters uh, or if the board thinks it needs more time, uh, we'll be able to uh, defer a decision. Uh, but that's a, a slight change to what we had previously announced. Uh, again, with the goal of providing as much transparency and opportunity for public input uh, as possible. So, Mr. Zahn? So, <clears throat> again, the, 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 for clarification, the only change from the process as, as was created previously is the uh, availability uh, of, for public documentation ahead of the February uh, 5th board, uh, board meeting and then uh, the ability for public to provide comment at the February 5th board meeting. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry if I wasn't clear on that. With that, Ms. Kilgut. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to um, report a little bit today. We received the <coughs> responses on January 8th as we had uh, originally published in our schedule. We received um, six responses. Um, one response had three different sites um, offered in within um, that response. We have um, done a great deal of evaluation on each uh, response that we received. Leading up to that, we had a lot of program development and crafting the invitation to negotiate to try to be thorough and comprehensive. We answered several questions along the way from the uh, prospective proposers and were able to hopefully clarify information there. We have had a group of JA staff, subject matter experts in different areas, disciplines of the company that would um, need to give some input on um, reviewing each of the proposals. Um, and then CBRE has had um, discussions with each respondent um, and further clarification so that as soon as they came in, they read every word, um, made a list of questions to try to clarify so that we're sure that we're understanding every element and are able to fairly compare each response with each other. Um, so with that, I want to announce the short list. Um, and this is in alphabetical order. Um, Kings Avenue Station, P3 LLC, located at Kings Avenue Station. Jacksonville 1C, Parcel 1 Holding Company, LLC, Lot J, Bay Street. And the Ryan Companies, US Inc. Um, and their site uh, that was proposed at 325 West Adams Street, which we all know as Block 48. Um, additionally, um, now, uh, once, now that the short list has been announced, we will advise each of the respondents. Um, CBRE will go into further negotiations with them. This past um, discussion has been mostly clarification um, so they will go into financial negotiations. We will have uh, presentations to staff and the CBRE group um, next week from each of the shortlisted groups. We will ask after that for them to submit their best and final financial offer that will readjust the pricing scores. And then um, we'll have the board meeting on the 5th, as we discussed, and um, in the format that you all just laid out. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank Ms. Kilgo and uh, Mr. McCarthy and the entire staff, uh, together with the outside consultant, CBRE. A lot of work already has been done. Uh, thank you for getting to this point. 
uh, and I know there's much work that uh, will be done over the next several weeks. So we'll look forward to uh, to February 5th. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Kilgo. Mr. McCarthy. JSAB report. And thank you for your work uh, with uh, Ms. Kilgo and the team on the headquarters. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm going to provide a report on JA's procurement and JSEB programs. Um, JSEB stands for Jacksonville Small Emerging Business Programs. Um, this report will provide uh, one, procurement results um, from FY18, JSEB results from FY18 and our JSEP opportunities in FY19 and going forward. Um, Jenny McCollum is our procurement director, and Rita Scott is our JSEP manager. They're both here today. They're responsible for these programs, but the great results you're going to hear about today are really the result of the entire JA team across all departments. I can't emphasize that enough. So for FY18 procurement results, we achieved total procurement savings of $10.5 million versus our $7.5 million goal. The total procurement savings is broken down into total cost difference and total sourcing savings. The total cost difference is the difference in the existing prices versus the new prices for the contracts that we source during FY18. It's a plus or, nine, plus or minus and we take the net for the contracts that we can compare like for like. Uh, during the year, we achieved $4.8 million in savings through the total cost difference. The total sourcing savings are the savings that we generate, the pricing reductions from the negotiations and the best and final offers and the other procurement methods we use to get better pricing. And the total sourcing savings during the year were $5.7 million. We had a really nice win recently on a new temporary staffing contract that will significantly increase the pool of qualified candidates for our temporary staffing requirements and will also provide lower margins that will save us $1.5 million. I'd like to recognize the JA team that worked on this initiative, Lisa Pleasance, Elaine Selders, Sonia Lee, Heather Fontaine, Robert Brocock, James Bryant, Katura Owens, Stephen Datz, and Pat Malis. They started working together on this about seven months ago and worked through many complex issues and achieved a really great win for us. For the JSEB results, our FY18 JSEB spend was $15.7 million versus a $13 million goal, which is 24% of our available spend versus the 20% goal as set by city ordinance. This is the highest level of JSEB spend that we've achieved in the past 10 years. And the graph on the right shows the steady growth over the past five years. To continue this trend, we'll need to grow JSEP capacity and bring new companies into the program. Details on our FY18 JSEP spend are provided on this slide, broken out by vendor type, prime versus spub. And on the bottom right, you'll see the small business entities that do not qualify for the JSEP program normally due to their size being too large. We, though these small business enterprises um, do not receive the benefits of JSEB program procurement bidding. Um, and um, we, uh, we count, we track their spend just for information, and we also go back to them from time to time to see if they'll qualify for the program. The acronyms on the pie chart in the slide, I'll just Go over them real quickly. AA is African American, WBE is Women Business Enterprise, HA is Hispanic American, AI and, N and NA are Asian and Native Americans, and other are non minorities and are typically white males. On the left hand side of this slide are the top 10 JSEB vendors by spend. Um, and we're, we're really going to look more to these companies to help out our other JSEBs to grow our JSEB capacity going forward. They've been successful in the program. They know how to work through it. And uh, they can help us grow our program. We had strong outreach during FY18. And I'll highlight that we had the first annual JSEB Procurement Summit, which was held on August 18th and attended by over 200 company representatives. And we also had two <coughs> events hosted by board member Newbill on February 8 and May 10, which was also a first ever at JEA. 
So for FY19 JSEB opportunities, the work categories on the right show current JSEB opportunities, and the work categories on the left show <coughs> growing opportunities for FY19 and beyond. I'll say it again. We'll need to bring new JSEB companies into our program, especially for these growth opportunities to continue that upward growth of our JSEB spend going forward. So this is the most important slide in this presentation. It maps out how we'll target outreach events to specific JSEB opportunities and bring new JSEB companies into our program. You can see on the slide, on December 20th, we had a landscape and sod workshop in anticipation, in anticipation of a sheltered landscape bid that will be coming out at the end of this month. We had 20, 20 folks attend that workshop, so we're optimistic that that will pay off. In February, on February 21, 2009, um, this is a great opportunity. We're going to have a septic tank phase-out workshop. Um, in anticipation of the bid for the septic tank phase-out project, Biltmore C, which will be toward the end of March. This is a $14 million construction <coughs> project with 10 to 20 percent JSEB opportunity. So it's really important that we get the word out and, and get them to come. Say it one more time, we need new JSEB companies to come out and participate in these opportunities. And we can also connect them to the local groups and resources you see on the left-hand side of this slide, and as I mentioned earlier, to our top JSEB spend companies that have already been successful in the program. We're off to a decent start for FY19. The $3.5 million spend for <coughs> FY19 Q1 is actually $500,000 higher than we were this time last year. However, we'll need to see increases in quarters two, three, and four like we did last year to achieve our $15 million goal. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Questions? Ms. Mm -hmm. Johnson? No, thank you. Ms. Green? No questions. Just uh, wanted to commend Mr. McCarthy on, um, on their efforts to get the word out to new companies um, John and I met last week, and uh, one of the things we feel like they're, they're, that may be missing is the training. There's a lot of small uh, contractors out there that feel like JEA may be just a little bit too big for them. Mm -hmm. But John's team is committed to helping with that curve. Um, so just wanted to commend the efforts of getting the word out. Thank, Thank you for your support. Reverend Newbill. I just want to echo his comment. Echoing the ditto. Ms. Flanagan. No questions. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll add to what my fellow board members have said. You guys have done a great job of uh, really building upon your past successes and uh, and not resting on your laurels. Keep uh, keep going ahead. And uh, I'll thank Jenny and Rita. You said they were in the audience. And also many of the, of the team that worked on the temp staffing are in the audience. Thank you all. Oh, great, great year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. We'll turn to Ms. Brooks with the uh, SJRPP Employees Retirement Plan. What? This is an, this is an administrative matter um, and a resolution that's going to change the compensation. Compen composition? Compen composition. Composition. <laughs> I'm say compensation. Composition. <laughs> the composition of the committee. I'm paying you for this. <laughs> no. the, um, the committee that, that's going to be continuing to, to administer the SJRPP pension plan. Um, will be JA employees, and it's just an administrative matter that, that needs to be tended to by this board. So is that a recommendation for board action to approve the revised committee um, to be composed of a JA treasurer, controller, and a joint owned electric representative? Yes. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Thank you, Revenue Bill. Is there a second? second. Thank you, Ms. Flanagan. Is there any discussion, any other questions for Ms. Brooks? Just changing the composition of the committee, not the duties right. and responsibilities, just who the members will be. That's correct. Okay. No questions. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we're up to a 4A, and I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Zahn, Strategic uh, Planning. Thank you, Anton. Um, so, uh, Board, uh, we have a representative, Anton, uh, with McKinsey, and uh, just want to, he'll be providing most of this presentation. This is a follow-up, uh, and I'm going to allow Anton to provide some 
an overview of McKinsey as well as kind of some of the steps that we're going to be embarking on over the next nine to 12 months. Uh, as the board knows, in April we started with a transition uh, towards uh, a commitment towards profitability and value creation, really em embodied by the strategic framework as well as the guiding principles, which the uh, board just passed and finalized today. Uh, and to that end, uh, now the, the next steps are to really start evaluating what the JEA of the future might look like. And to that end, uh, I thought it would be interesting for this board um, to understand the iterative process that we're going to uh, take, uh, as well as uh, how we plan to include the public, as well as all of our stakeholders at City Council and, and the administration and relative to uh, answering some of the major questions that have been asked. Thank you, Mr. Son. Anton, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron. And thanks for the opportunity to address this board on the topic of uh, strategic planning. As you know, we, we are partnering right now with JA to develop the next steps in the strategic uh, planning effort. And I wanted to give you a quick update on kind of where we are in the process and what the process will look like going forward. So as you know, the industry right now is experiencing a number of significant trends that uh, kind of circle around the technology, the policy, the new preferences from customers, the influx of new capital, all that together, in our opinion, uh, uh, will provide a very important opportunity to redefine strategy for a number of utilities and GA included. And that's why we were quite excited to see a request for proposal that came from GA a few months ago, and we are excited to submit our proposal and now supporting GA in this endeavor. So right now we are working on developing a 10-year strategic plan, and we are at the I would describe as phase two of the work. I will show you kind of how it uh, fits into the overall process of, def of defining the strategy. But first, I'd like to speak a bit about the overall objectives of the effort, right? When we think about what strategy will look like, we definitely would like to make sure that there's a number of principles that we keep in mind, such as maintaining customer affordability, thinking about growth, positioning GA for long-term success, so not prioritizing the near-term, if you will, wins, but thinking about the long-term um, the success of the enterprise. We also highlighted and we shared with the management team as we were kind of working through our approach and describing how we would work, we also described the seven core principles that will inform our strategy overall. First, we believe that the strategy needs to be responsive to trends, and so we are working right now basically aligning, and I'll talk a bit more about uh, the status quo analysis that we're doing right now. We also would like to align on the clear vision for the future, right? So we're not just responding to trends as we see them right now, but we also have a long-term vision in mind, what GA should look like 10 years from now. We also believe in having defined and quantified metrics. We believe that strategy without numbers is just dry, and frankly speaking, not all that useful. And so we are going to work with GA together to think about what metrics we should be tracking and what numbers uh, should be associated with them. So how we're going to measure if we're winning or losing in executing our strategy. Which brings me to the point around having a very clear process to track and measure progress, and, and then having a line organization. We also would like to make sure that the organization is aligned about where the, com where the company is going. And so everyone in this, in this building and in the field really understands the overall direction of the company and understands how his or her role fits into this um, story. Last but not least, we also believe in ownership. And so at the end, when we define all the strategic initiatives, we would like to make sure that ownership is clear. And so everyone understands who is driving what and who is accountable for, deli for delivering measurable results. Where we are in the process, the next page. Uh, <clears throat> so at this point of time, we are in phase two. And, it, and, and phase two of the work is focusing on a couple of important things. One is around figuring out the status quo, or basically what will happen if GA takes no action. And it is a little bit of a if you, you can call it a bit of a theoretical exercise, but we wanted to make sure that we clearly understand what the future will look like if no strategic action is taken. We also will think about the metrics and we'll also think about what our aspiration should be in this phase. Then phase three will focus on specific initiatives that we will need to undertake to address the issues on hand, whatever we identify. Phase four will be about executable plan and phase five, phase five would be around building alignment. I wanted to reiterate one thing that was clearly conveyed to us by the management team that this is a very iterative process. So I wouldn't take that pretty much, I wouldn't take it as a sequential. We would expect to provide you with frequent updates and seek the input here. So by no means uh, expect that you will be given at the end just the final product and that's it, right? That's very much an interactive, pro interactive process we want to engage on. 
And I'm going to jump in here. <clears throat> the, the, the next the major step, really, in, in any strategic planning process is, as Anton had, had mentioned, to define what does status quo look like. Mm -hmm. So w what happens if we do nothing? Um, so the board and the public and, and the city council and all of our stakeholders you know, should expect over the next couple of months, uh, probably by sometime in March or April, for us to be able to come back as a management team uh, with McKinsey and present uh, a status quo base co baseline scenario that says, this is what the business sh would look like over the next 10 years in the event of no change. Um, it will be absolutely critical for this board to be able to review the baseline assumptions, to be able to understand them, and then ultimately for us to all to come to some sort of consensus relative to that baseline, uh, because that will effectively be the point of starting, uh, the starting point for determining initiatives of growth going forward. Um, so that in phase two, really the way we look at this in terms of that iterative approach is, is that we would bring back that baseline uh, scenario and, and ask the board to review it and ultimately adopt it as you know, the, the status quo baseline that we can move forward from. Great. And just, just to build on what Aaron just said, the next page provides an overview of what <clears throat> the current phase will look like with a bit more specificity. As you can see, right now we are engaged in two <coughs> primary activities. One is developing a status quo business as usual forecast of a set of scenarios, if you will, and projections that Aaron just elaborated on. The second piece, which I will spend a bit more time next, maybe next couple of minutes, we are also developing a culture and organizational health baseline. In our view, it's equally important to have a very clear snapshot of where you are, not just from a financial standpoint, but also how the organization acts, how it operates, how it feels about strategic direction. I will describe in a minute the tool that we're using, but the, when it comes to the baseline, we're doing both financial and organizational health baselines together. Once we have the baseline in place and the board had an opportunity to reflect on it and give us the input, we will think about different scenarios as well as metrics and the overall targets for performance and health, very much alike. And lastly, we'll set the, kind of the aspirations for J8. So that is the scope of phase two, which we expect to come to go from uh, January till end of March, early April. Let me speak for a few minutes about um, organizational health and why we believe it's important to measure it very much like you are measuring performance. So in, uh, in all our research, and McKinsey has done extensive research of what makes successful companies successful, we constantly stumble upon this issue that companies that may have been successful in the past sometimes do not, do not last. Their success is not lasting. And so we ask ourselves the question of what's the secret sauce that enables certain organizations to prevail over the years, right, and be successful in industry leaders. And so the answer for us is it's a combination of focusing on performance, which we'll talk a lot today about and in the future, as well as organizational health. And in a simple way, the way how we define organizational health is how you run the place, how the organization aligns itself, executes with excellence, and renews itself over time. We developed a proprietary survey, which by now we've um, administered to about 1,700 companies, where we have 5 million responses. It's a global survey, and uh, the outputs are very benchmarkable. We can benchmark within the industries. We can benchmark across the continents. We've done it within the utility space water, gas, power alike in North America and globally. So the scope of benchmarking is fairly extensive. Right now, we're in the middle of um, this process with JEA. The survey was launched on January 15th. Uh, it goes to every employee of the company, slightly shy of 2,000 people. So at this stage, I'm happy to report that we crossed 70% participation, So, which gives us uh, a very exciting opportunity to have statistically significant level of response. The survey will close in a week from now. And in our experience, everything north of 60% by the time of closure of the report is statistically significant. You're already above 70. So I think we will have a very solid snapshot of where we are today and what we would like to change, if anything, with the culture and health going forward. And, and one of the things, you know, to, to break this down, we, you've heard us talk over the last six to nine months about the listening tours that the management team has been on and about talking to all 2,000 of our employees and getting feedback. Uh, ultimately, the OHI, what it starts to do is put a quantitative uh, approach towards effectively establishing a baseline so that we can know how to invest in our people, how to invest in our culture, so that our employees know it's much more than just us listening. But this is now our proactive approach towards addressing some of the issues that we've heard 
uh, by effectively, much like our dashboard uh, aligns uh, along our four basic measures of value. So uh, this will start to create metrics around our, our culture that we can then start to attract the baseline uh, and, and the improvement, therefore. So um, I'm sure the results will be really interesting. Uh, but at the end of the day, it'll be a matter of uh, how do we go from that baseline to something right. that we want it to be, as opposed to what are the results uh, coming out of the uh, current survey. That's exactly right. So what to expect at the end of the effort, right? And then we, want, we wanted to share with you uh, the kind of final deliverables when it's all said and done a few months from now uh, after phase five, right? So we believe that we'll have fully vetted financial forecasts. We'll have a solid understanding of the current state for JAA. We will have specific measurable and achievable targets for JAA across performance and health. The pipeline of initiatives with clear ownership and a way of tracking them that ultimately will add up to the, uh, to the roadmap and the fully executable strategic plan. And I would like to emphasize the word executable because, and, and that's why you, you, keep, you keep hearing me emphasizing the quantitative nature of metrics, the rigor behind the ownership, because we find that fundamentally believe that without those elements, the plan is just, is just the plan. We wanna, we wanna make sure that we are gonna produce something which will be put to action and position GAA for long-term success. At this point of time, we are working um, under the assumption what we call the limits of performance. So we're not limiting ourselves to any constraints, right? We're basically figuring out what, what, at least that's our aspiration, what we should be doing going forward. And then I think we'll ask ourselves, what are the practical constraints that may exist and how we may choose or, or may not choose to engage with them and, 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 uh, and, and address them. And lastly, my last page is to talk about the next steps. So as I mentioned, on January 15th, we launched the Organizational Health Index Survey. It will close next week. And then on March 25th, we're going to present and discuss with you the status quo baseline scenario. And lastly, on April 23rd, we hope uh, to have a final review and finalize it and uh, put, it, uh, put it on the books and then start planning the actions going forward. So one of the things that you know I hope the board sees is that uh, we are starting to put metrics around uh, so that we can establish and measure and communicate uh, in an open way on a monthly basis progress of the company, both financially, operationally, uh, environmentally, from a community impact perspective, as well as from a cultural perspective now with the OHI, so that we have this holistic approach at moving, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. I'll uh, just open it up for questions from the board. Uh, Reverend Newbill, Ms. Green, Ms. Johnson. Uh, no direct questions for me, but but uh, these efforts are going to be uh, very contextual for certainly from a compensation side of things for the compensation committee. So I applaud the efforts on um, bringing this full circle, establishing a baseline, and really taking a thorough look. So over 70% is fantastic. And I'm glad to hear that we have that level of engagement to have. Um, true application to the organizational health. So thank you. Ms. Flanagan. I'm curious um, if it's intended for board members to participate in the in the survey process as well or if the audience is is intended to be in surveys. Yeah, we've not uh, been solicited for input into the organizational health uh, survey, but um, I think that's appropriate and I would add to that um, so your phase two, as you've outlined it, Anton, is uh, to establish a current state uh, state of the uh, company and also to uh, set uh, ambitions and uh, aspirations for future performance and culture. I would encourage you uh, and your cohorts to reach out to individual members of the board and seek their input during that phase. That is very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So who's winning? Power Rangers? Culture Club? Who's in first place? Culture Club. Culture Club. <laughs> I thought Carrie might jump up with that one. Anyone else have questions? Uh, we established teams so that <laughs> <I> oh, <laughs> sorry. to drive a competition so that we could determine. Yeah. Yeah. We established teams internally of yeah. four teams uh, to see if we could. Uh, our goal is to get well, well in excess of 85% of the employees. So, okay. Good job by everyone. Thank you, Anton. Appreciate you Thank and you uh, all the work that you and your team are doing. Oh, uh, fantastic. Okay, turn to Ms. Brooks uh, on the uh, delegation of authority policy update. Yeah, this is not a, a presentation by any means. It's just an update to the board of where we're at in the delegation of authority. We're trying to capture all the historic delegations over time. 
um, and it's uh, a challenging endeavor, uh, but I wanted to let the board know that it has not fallen off the radar and that we are continuing in the process of putting the delegation um, policy together. And I, I submitted a draft into the package, but it's um, a, a work in progress. Is it true that some of those prior delegations were done like on carbon paper with a typewriter? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what I thought. I, I, I want to commend uh, Ms. Brooks and, and, and the uh, OGC and other attorneys that have been working on this. This is, this is really the, I mean, the, to, to put it together, you're taking, talking about 125 years of governmental agency running and documenting things in the best way possible and then trying to find a way to consolidate this into a total governance and delegation uh, of authority uh, program that would be more suitable of a multi-billion dollar organization uh, running in today's day and age. Um, it's, I, I would say, at times tedious. Um, but and, and so I think this will probably be the last time we give you all of the documents, but we want to make sure this. Uh, so we'll start uh, shrinking our board packages from 300 plus pages down. Um, but it is uh, an, an effort that is of high importance, especially as we look at a lot of the transitions uh, that have under uh, that the company's gone through over the last number of uh, months, and looking forward to make sure that uh, any authority issues going forward will be for the public and our counterparts and rating agencies well understood that we have uh, very uh, strict in, uh, policies in place that close any loopholes that might have existed in the past. It is a uh, necessary update, and. Uh, I second uh, Mr. Zahn in my thanks for uh, the thankless task that you've undertaken. Thank you. Sometimes those daisy wheel typewriters, they weren't really <laughs> legible. <laughs> uh, so uh, with that, Mr. Wanamaker, demand pricing update. Um, where did Mr. Wanamaker, there he is, get up here. You have uh, two proud members of the Culture Club presenting here tonight. <laughs> Uh, we are winning, in fact. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we are going to present uh, JEA's demand rate pilot update. Um, the, the demand rate pilot began in January of 2014, and five years later we lead the industry in the exploration of residential demand rate pricing. Uh, we believe this rate structure will be the cornerstone for a platform to embrace new energy technologies in the future. So our four measures of value, uh, customer value, financial value, uh, community impact value, and environmental value are always top of mind. And so um, as such, we'll indicate to you throughout the presentation which values are applicable at the top of each slide. As I mentioned, this program has been a major initiative for uh, JEA for several years. The purpose of our discussion today is to give the board an update on the progress of the program and the path forward. Um, so first we'll review our current consumption pricing model and the impact on revenue. We'll describe the long-standing demand pricing model um, that we see every other industry uh, use today and its potential impact to JEA. We'll detail um, our own key learnings um, from five years of consistent testing and piloting of our demand rate solution. And lastly, we'll lay out a path forward to finalize the learnings uh, by market testing the solutions against a statistically significant cross-section of our customer base. So um, in the 57 years leading up to 2006, there were only three years that resulted in year-over-year -year sales decline. Uh, in 2006, the iPhone was still a year away from creation. The average LED light bulb cost $40, and solar panels were nearly $10 a watt. Since that time, the price of LED bulbs and solar panels have fallen by over 90%, and Apple has sold 1.5 billion iPhones. Technology has changed dramatically, along with our business. From 2007 to 2017, JEA had $1.4 billion less cash flow than we forecasted in our 2006 integrated resource plan. Today, uh, we are $250 million less free cash flow than we expected each year. Uh, per capita consumption is lower. Future electric unit sales will likely be flat or declining, and the effects of energy efficiency and the growth of distributed uh, generation are just beginning to take effect. We pr have presented these trends to the board over the last few months. And as we presented in previous board meetings last summer and in the fall, 
Uh, we're working to understand the total impact of these trends and working on programs like beneficial electrification uh, to mitigate these impacts. Electric utility rate structures like JEAs, uh, in place for more than 100 years, recover almost all fixed infrastructure costs through mm -hmm. variable uh, consumption-based rates. Um, this impact has been the same across the, the, the industry. It's not just, uh, not just confined to JEA. So the most common solution to recover infrastructure costs uh, has simply been to increase the basic monthly charge. And so while it may seem fair to pass along the, the same cost um, in, the, in the increase of a basic monthly charge to every consumer, we can see when we look at this that uh, it's not always the case. So you can see um, by the arrows um, from the example that the inequity created when the costs are not distributed based on the individual customer's usage of the grid. It has other disadvantages in that it affords the customer no control over the increases because it's fixed. It doesn't promote conservation. And low demand, low income customers are hurt the most since they already spend a disproportionate <coughs> amount of their disposable income on utilities in comparison to our average customer. So to allow for customer choice, we have to align our rate structure with our cost structure. JEA's cost of service can be broken into variable costs and fixed costs. Variable costs are tied directly to customer consumption, primarily fuel. Uh, when customers use less electricity, we burn less fuel. For these costs, consumption-based pricing models make sense. Fixed costs, on the other hand, generally don't change with consumption. Meters, wires, poles, um, and customer service costs are very fixed. Uh, our generation costs are directly impacted by system peak demand. So today, for residential mm -hmm. customers, about 90% of these fixed costs are collected through variable consumption-based energy charges. So an ideal rate structure um, would have a fixed charge, a demand charge, and a consumption-based charge. The fixed charge would recover customer costs like billing, the meter, and the connection to your home. The demand charge would be used to collect the cost of generation uh, that we need to maintain to serve peak demand. And consumption-based charge would be utilized to collect the cost of fuel and other uh, variable costs. So as we think about customer choice in the future, it leads to an environment where different customers use the system differently. In the future, this kind of rate structure will provide the right kind of price signals to customers. As customers change behavior and save money, JEA's costs will decrease as well which will drive down the cost for all. So let's discuss the demand rate pricing model. <clears throat> for many years, other industries have used demand pricing strategies effectively to level market volatility for product demand, and these strategies are incredibly mainstream today. Companies like Delta, Uber, and Disney World are just a few of the recognizable companies who use demand, volume, or surge pricing models that most consumers are familiar with. It's very simple to understand, and again, most consumers today do understand, that you pay more during peak periods of product demand. As you know, a utility is required to carry 115% energy capacity for our highest peak, or for our coldest day of the year. Consumers understand that Ticketmaster isn't required to have 115% capacity available for the Florida Georgia game. And likewise, they know they can't use their miles on Delta or their Florida resident discount passes at Disney during peak demand periods. And while this should be seen as a good sign for customer acceptance, J.D. Power said in its 2019 Utility Industry Outlook that they have found that when pricing options are forced on utility customers, they respond significantly with lower customer satisfaction scores. But all is not lost. The firm also noted that time of use rates, are, when are implemented as a part of a broader initiative, complete with proactive communications and options for customer control, satisfaction can actually improve. We're going to talk a little bit more about the impact of customer acceptance in another slide. So in fact, uh, demand pricing isn't new to utilities, and it's not even new to JEA. Our first demand rates for commercial customers were implemented over 40 years ago. And today, uh, nearly 4,500 commercial industrial customers are, are on it. These demand charges recognize that commercial customers can use the grid very differently, 
A steel mill uses our system very differently from a church, for example. Demand pricing allows us to charge them uh, both based on their individual use of our infrastructure. Until the mid-2000s, the energy needs of a home were pretty much homogenous, and consumption billing was appropriate. I'll continue to press the f stress the fact that more energy efficient homes and appliances, coupled with the rise in distributed generation and electric vehicles, mean that not all residential customers use the grid in the same way anymore. So how is demand different from consumption uh, in the utility space? Demand focuses on when you use electricity. Consumption focuses on how much you use. So in the example of the car on this slide, uh, you can think of demand as the speedometer and consumption as the odometer. Both cars have the same consumption. They both went 100 miles. But the dragster's need for speed created a higher demand on the engine. So this brief two-minute video uh, was provided to our opt-in demand rate pilot participants, and it summarizes the reasons that JEA is consider considering a demand pricing model. Today, we all need energy to keep us cool, dry our clothes, cook our food, and heat our water. But when and how we do those things varies by individual. Most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about how much electricity it takes to run our appliances or what time we turn them on. Nor do we consider that everyone using multiple appliances at the same time creates a peak demand on the energy grid, which increases costs for everyone. That's why JEA and other power companies are creating price plans to better match what it really costs to serve different customers. In the end, everyone pays for what they really use. On JEA's current electric rate plan, most of your bill is based only on the amount of energy you use and the fuel required to generate that energy. Even though your bill isn't based on the amount of demand you place on the electric system when you turn multiple appliances on at the same time, they still create peaks and valleys in your energy supply needs, also known as your energy demand. Utilities are required by law to maintain enough energy supply to meet the highest peak demand of its customers all the time. Up until now, most energy companies, including JEA, rolled that cost into the energy charge. It was sort of a one-size-fits-all approach. To make things more equitable, JEA is introducing JEA Smart Savings. With this new plan, your bill will not include the energy charge as before. Instead, it will be based on two things, peak demand and fuel. You pay for your peak demand and the cost of the fuel to make the electricity you use. That gives you more control, which can result in more savings. But the key to keeping those savings is trimming your peak demand, especially during the electric system's peak hours. So what is peak demand? It might help to think about electricity like the internet service you need to stream a movie in your home. When just one device is streaming, everything works just fine. But if two or three people start watching different movies on different devices at the same time, they've created a peak demand. Peak demand costs utilities more because they put more strain on the grid. That's the network of power plants, lines, and other equipment that keeps your electricity flowing. So to reduce your peaks and save money, think about your appliances, say an electric range and a dishwasher. Make them take turns instead of running them at the same time. And remember, reducing your peak demand matters most during the electric system's peak hours, noon to 7 p.m. weekdays, April through October, and 6 to 9 a.m. weekday mornings, November to March. Holidays and weekends are excluded from peak hour charges. Peak hours are also the time to avoid running electric dryers, which are big energy hogs. Now that you know these are the most expensive times to run multiple appliances, you can save by avoiding these times. And the way to save the most is to make your appliances take turns all the time, to keep your peak demand low all the time. Learn more about JEA Smart Savings at JEA.com slash Smart Savings. So what is a capital intensive, high fixed cost business caught in a flat to declining unit sales market do? We create a pricing structure for the future that positions JEA to have a sound foundation that is resilient and innovative to handle market disruptors like technology, energy efficiency, and distributive energy resources. 
If our rate structure matches our cost structure, we can fairly apportion to each customer their share of the cost to use the electric system, which means that we can create an active customer partner who uses the grid more efficiently and drives down costs for all. So let's go through some of our, our key learnings here um, and the timeline of how we got to today. Our initial thought leadership began in 2014 uh, with, our, with our rate design working group where we conducted our first focus groups. Those learnings led to our opt-in pilot with 116 customers and employees currently on the rate. The feedback from those opt-in pilot participants drove us to test additional rate designs that potentially provide higher customer acceptance while maintaining revenue stability. In August of last year, we tested um, a second wave of focus group participants, 60 focus group participants, um, to get their views on the understandability and perceived fairness of each rate. The two highest performing rates from the focus groups were then weather stress tested to determine bill stability. All of this work has led to some key learning. So the question that you may be asking is the same question that I asked when I got here almost two years ago. Why is this taking so long? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first, we needed a full year of data to get a baseline on our customers. And then we needed another full year to study how customers would behave or respond to the rate and then view the impacts of weather has to that rate. We can now confirm that demand pricing is less impacted by weather and provides more bill stability than KWH. We also learned that customers perceive more and longer demand intervals to be fairer, like one hour versus 15 minute increments. Customers overwhelmingly like the opportunity to save by avoiding peak periods and the choice that it offers them as consumers. Customers also believe that technology is needed to manage use effectively, which has driven our enabling tech pilot, which we'll be discussing next. Our work has not gone unnoticed outside of these walls <coughs> either. As you can tell, this is a very difficult process to get customers to understand how to either consume differently to save energy. Um, but because our leadership in the area, demand pricing preparation and enabling tech research and development over the last five years, we are leading the way in the utility industry and we're chairing a residential demand and time of use working group that includes the biggest utilities in the United States. Southern Company, FPL, Duke, Entergy, Tico, and Hydro-Quebec are just a few examples. We currently lead 30 individuals representing 15 IOU, Muni, and co-op utilities participating in one hour monthly conference calls to discuss lessons learned and benchmarking opportunities that again, we are leading these efforts in. Um, I spoke a bit about enabling technology, but we are currently in the midst of conducting research and development into enabling technology that we feel is necessary to support the customer in a demand pricing scenario. Our current 250 customer employee pilot will test the state-of-the-art customer home energy management tool that delivers real-time energy use information with alert capability through mobile and tablet apps. It will include an affordable consumer engagement tool that allows the customer to control their appliances, primarily HVAC and water heaters. Um, it'll allow them to watch videos uh, for guides. It'll allow them to participate in fun gamification that encourages education through entertainment and managing their usage. Um, and while I say we're in the midst of it, what I really mean is we did our first installation of home technology on Friday um, in Mr. Wanamaker's house. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, uh, Ryan has been a part of um, the pilot from the very beginning as have a lot of employees and I would encourage you as board members this is the perfect time if you would like to join the demand rate pilot especially now that we're bringing on this enabling technology to see what our customers are going to be experiencing as well as to receive feedback from you on, on what your perceptions are of the rate and the enabling technology as I said on the, er the earlier slide, this is cutting edge technology. This is not off the shelf. We are building it and we are benchmarking it with peers across the country. So we'd love to have you join us. Our customers would love to have you join us. Um, so see me after the meeting if you would like to be on the demand rate. Before we move on, I, I, I don't think this can be stressed enough. Um, the demand rate, uh, everything we've talked about for the last six to nine months, uh, electrification, electric vehicles, distributed generation, storage, 
all of the things that we talk about that are in the news all the time are enabled, and JEA is enabled to be a part of that because of the demand rate. Um, to give you an idea, the app that Carrie just talked about and that Mr. Wanamaker is uh, um, now uh, a proud participant in gives you total control over your energy system in your house. So, you know, the, this, the iPhone, the Android, your smart devices that we all now use for biometrics, that we use for voting, that we use for all sorts of news and media and other things that the way we, the way we consume has clearly changed in the last 10 years. And, and JEA is not a stranger to that, as we know, because we've lost $250 million a year in free cash flow. This app changes the way we interface with our customer. It allows the customer to have control over their energy load. Um, that can't be stressed uh, any more significantly that JEA is leading this and that the team uh, that, that is working for JEA is, is one of the foremost leaders in the entire United States uh, relative to pioneering the systems and, and how to integrate this a, as a full solution for the customer. Um, I, that is customer value 101, which is giving the customer total control over the, how they buy things, when they buy them, and where they buy them. Um, I don't, so, you know, people should take that to heart. So that's a great segue on the path forward. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of work, I think you can see that, that, that has gone into this program up to this point. Uh, we still have quite a bit of work ahead of us. Um, and the next step is, um, as we plan to move into our opt-out pilot this summer. Um, in preparation for that, we will have a rate hearing at the March board meeting to make adjustments to the current demand rate and add an additional rate to test during that phase. The opt-out pilot will be a statistically significant study to evaluate customer behavior as we test our communication strategies, customer support responses, and enabling technologies um, like the app um, to complete this final phase of our learning. So with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Ms. Johnson. Uh, very forward thinking. No questions from me, but uh, I might be talking to you afterwards. Thank you. Ms. Green. Very exciting, and uh, I'll think about being a... <laughs> 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 I'll think about that. Uh, when we talk about technology, and especially when you use the words like smart home, um, will the customer's economic status pro prohibit them from being able to participate? Those are all things that we are taking into consideration right now. Understanding that um, w will JEA provide the technology, will it be made available via, uh, via um, retail outlets, we're not really sure yet. We're just taking a look at the technology, understanding what's out there, what we can build, how much it will cost, um, what will customer adoption be. Will it be, as we've discussed at past board meetings, um, a fun tool that they will adopt and we will pay for, and then they'll never use it again? Mm -hmm. So a lot is going to hinge on what we see this summer with the 2,000 customer pilot. Um, but our low-income customer needs are being taken into consideration every step of the way. Mm -hmm. Revenue bill. Ms. Flanagan. Could you clarify for me the difference between opt-in and opt-out? Sure. Um, so the initial stage of the pilot was um, we made it available to uh, first a handful of employees to make sure it worked, <laughs> and then uh, opened it up to um, customers who were interested in, um, in participating in it. Uh, we did not make a strong marketing push around it, but, but we got about, um, uh, I think it was 50 or so um, in, uh, customers who, who called in and wanted to, to join. Um, and that was really a proof of concept, if you will, um, to, to test it, to, to see what worked, and to try to get some feedback. The opt-out is actually um, more of a statistically significant study to see what would this look like if um, we were to roll it out to all of our customers um, and to try to learn um, uh, customer behavior and, and how um, that might be impacted by that kind of a program. And so the real difference is just that statistically significant element to the study um, where, we can, where we can gauge how that might impact the system. It truly is a paradigm shift. I, I don't 
I don't want people to, to miss that. Um, and I applaud the uh, team for uh, being out there leading uh, the industry uh, and uh, making JA an example for other uh, utilities to look up to. One of the things that I hoped that we would learn, and, and maybe we did, and it just didn't get highlighted, what were the savings uh, on average that were experienced by um, participants in the uh, pilot, if any? Yeah, so um, we have limited data from the opt-in. Um, as you might imagine, I think it tends to be um, self-selecting mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, but, but generally, the rate was um, designed, and the way we have designed it is, is to be revenue neutral. So this is no, um, no change in terms of um, uh, for the average customer. Um, however, um, behavior in terms of how people use their appliances and, and how much intensity they use uh, will, drive, will drive the bill impacts for each individual customer. Well, I appreciate that we're looking to be revenue neutral, particularly given some of the uh, discussions we've had here today and in past board meetings. But if it's revenue neutral to the customer, what other than altruism is the incentive for them to participate? So they will see um, they will see savings based on how they use their appliances. So if they are able to, as the video kind of discussed, uh, take turns um, with their large appliances, their uh, hot water heater, their uh, AC, the uh, the stove, those those kind of big energy users, um, that's how they'll be able to save money on this on this um, pilot. And the good news is that not only will they be saving money, but it'll also be um, having a positive impact on our costs and so it's not as if they're saving money and somebody else is paying for it it's reducing costs for everyone I do I, want to add further clarification that it's meant to be revenue neutral if you don't change your behavior right mm -hmm. so if you don't change your behavior um, the goal is that you won't see much difference in your bill if you want to lower your bill under the new demand rate um, you will learn to change your behavior and you can impact your bill Okay, thank you for that. Yes. So were the customers that opted in, were they given that training on how to adjust their behavior within mm -hmm. the household? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I, I think that's part of during the strategic planning process as we look at the app, as we look at electrification, and I, it's uh, as, as the team had said, you can't really roll out a rate change or a change of the way you, you bill your customer if you don't give them the tools. So part of this is, is not only looking at the study in terms of gaining a st statistically significant amount of data, but it's also making sure JEA can arm its customers with the appropriate tools to take advantage of that change at the time that we ultimately move that way. Anything else? Thank you for that clarification, Ms. Stewart. <coughs> I, I, I think I'm on record as uh, saying that I believe incentives drive behavior, so um, <laughs> I appreciate that opportunity. And my last and most important question is, has Mr. Wanamaker figured out how to master this technology in his home yet? I think you should ask his wife. I will. <laughs> Thank you for your... <laughs> Thank you both. And I think she would answer yes. <laughs> oh, she okay. has, actually. She <laughs> has. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions on demand rate? Uh, okay. Thank you very much. And, uh, and again, audits to you. I'll turn to uh, Ms. Johnson, who is serving as uh, the uh, interim chair of our compensation committee. Uh, in Mr. Campion's uh, absence. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I probably, can I call Ms. Dykes up just in case we need an overview of the five to five? Thank you. Um, we, we met recently and went through overall uh, the importance of total compensation philosophy and strategy as a committee. And, and as appropriately put, Anton even highlighted the importance of establishing a strategic baseline um, before we can put in what, what I would, would say is total compensation packages in itself. Uh, and, and he certainly highlighted appropriately the importance of the culture um, being driven by the, the, the organizational makeup, um, certainly em employee behaviors, and how the strategy itself can drive the business. Uh, and so to that point, uh, certainly the board and, and Aaron have um, placed a level of importance on making sure that we align all employee compensation to the total compensation philosophy and result versus baseline. Uh, and, and to that point, I want to actually thank Mr. Zahn uh, in making sure that we, we follow that and focus on that before 
getting his contract situated and, and, and the like, um, because it's very important that we make sure that we get these things established in an overall timeline um, to make sure everybody's moving and rowing in the right direction. Uh, one of the things that I did want to point out is as we go through the timeline, everyone has their presentation, uh, the presentation that we went through. Um, we'll be looking to uh, establish baseline status quo and et cetera in March and hopefully being able to wrap up everything in May. With that said, I'm going to toss it to Mr. Zahn and he's going to take you through a little bit of the, the philosophy that we talked about in our meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, appreciate the time. Um, as discussed, uh, what, what you see in front of you is, is really a, a, a timeline and stepwise approach to making sure that the entire organization is aligned around the four basic fundamental values that have been outlined in the guiding principles. Customer value, financial value, community impact value, and environmental value. Um, this is kind of where the rubber starts hitting the road, right? Um, in terms of uh, letting our employees know that those are the things those are the about pieces of value that uh, we as a board and as a management team and as a community want the entire 2,000 uh, population of employees to start driving. To that end, um, so th the total compensation philosophy is uh, intended to apply to all employees, not just to myself. Uh, so there's, there should be no difference between management and, and the front line uh, in terms of how we add value to the community. Um, the uh, board has just finalized the guiding principles in today's meeting. Uh, so I, I really thank you for all the work that's gone into that over the last nine months. Uh, it's certainly been, I will tell you, as, as the 2,000 employees uh, weighed in and, and, and really spent quite a bit of time crafting that, so uh, it is a, a, a launch point for our strategic planning process. Uh, as, as Mr. Durkock uh, talked about with McKinsey, uh, the next step for strategic planning is creating the baseline. What happens if you do nothing? Um, because it's really impossible to then tell anybody, well, here's your baseline. We want you to change, or, or we want you to move up. Uh, if, you, if the current measure of value is 0.5, then how do you incentivize going from 0.5 to 0.6, or 0.6 to 0.7, and so on and so forth? So the total compensation philosophy would then take into account basically that the baseline uh, uh, forecast plus the guiding principles and start to establish metrics that we can measure and start to create incentives around. Uh, our hope would be to complete that process by sometime around April uh, with the board in terms of the baseline, setting the baseline, and then being with that baseline in hand and this total compensation philosophy to be able to produce a program that truly can be long, long lived. As I said, the guiding principles now become more than just talk. Uh, they become tru truly things we put in action. Uh, and so the, the, just a reminder of the, of the path that has been walked, not that this board needs a massive reminder, but for the public, these, this is a multi-month iterative process that continues and will continue as we move into strategic planning. The guiding principles, which you know, uh, have been in the packages uh, over the last three to four months, again, uh, the same uh, um, for everyone to see, and really the four corporate measures that, that, that um, you know, were taken from the city council's work uh, in the subcommittee report on the future of JEA. They were taken from this board. They were taken from the employees. And the value of those is that we now have 2,000 employees that day in and day out uh, have, are measured against results of driving those four basic measures of value. As I said, it, it's, um, and, and I've now sat down with uh, almost every single city council member, uh, including Councilman Schellenberg, to, to really stress that those four basic measures are what we will use to go forward relative to guiding actions and, and ultimately measuring results. And it is important for an alignment uh, of this entire community as well that they know that all 2,000 employees are driving those four basic me measures. Um, and so uh, in, in in October, we cascaded out uh, in a kind of an objective and key result format, or what some people call KPIs, key performance indicators, uh, a program that basically cascades results all the way down to the front line and then back up that allows for every single employee to be matched to our dashboard. So that when the board is reviewing the monthly, monthly dashboard, it's not just monthly results that the management team produces, but it's month, monthly results that ultimately guide action day in and day out of 2,000 people. 
Um, the corporate measures, uh, in, and this is where the total compensation for, I think, myself and Melissa and the team becomes real, which is we start to have to take this ownership mentality uh, that we as employees are responsible for driving measures. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you incentivize that? Well, you create a team that ultimately thinks about how do you work together, right? Because, you know, I'm a big believer that, and I think I've s said this publicly, and I'm on the record as well, saying, as a CEO, I will never be successful unless all 2,000 people are headed in the same direction. Um, that is the ultimate uh, alignment of working together. And so, and, and, and so, to me, the total compensation philosophy is what really one where uh, we need to create a program and a philosophy that uh, doesn't single out any individual, but really set, aligns all 2,000 to the same program and to the same results. Um, and to that end, uh, employees' incentives should then, therefore, drive value for the company, for the community, and they should drive teamwork. Uh, because if you do both and you, and you uh, have an alignment around those four basic measures, then ultimately, while you may still have bumps in the road, you're going to be all headed in the right direction, and you'll know when you're making mistakes. Um, in 2014... Uh, the board of JEA had published published a, uh, a policy 2.7, which has been presented to the compensation committee, uh, and it really called out exactly, you know, a philosophical approach to compensation. Um, what we would point out, though, is that this philosophy, once you read it, it says effectively the following, uh, that t all 2,000 employees should be compensated at the 50th percentile of the market doesn't say to do what, to drive what value, to go in what direction, to create what behavior, to align to which culture. Uh, it just says pay 50th percentile. So to that end, uh, what you see is, is the result of the last four or five years in, 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 in terms of the compensation structure. The base compensation of JEA is roughly 50th percentile. The short term is actually in terms of incentives, those incentives that that create short-term results like cost efficiencies and environmental efficiencies, JSEP spending, those types of things, uh, we're actually well below the 20th, 25th percentile. And on long-term incentives, we actually have none. Uh, those long-term incentives tend to be the things that have direct correlations to losing $250 million of free cash flow annually. Um, and so you, it would be no wonder that while we have been moving for the last five to ten years, that, and those statistics are, have been well known. In fact, Ms. Dykes, I, I think almost every year you get up and say we, we've lost X number of million dollars in, in revenue, and mm -hmm. um, that you wouldn't see direct changes in behavior because, in fact, employees aren't incentivized to do so. Um, so how do you change that? Uh, and this is, again, you've seen this chart, I think, over and over, and, and my guess is, is as we move into status quo, you'll start to see a forecast uh, on this. You start to reevaluate re and, and, and recommend a board policy that, uh, number one, uh, the last uh, sentence of the first paragraph says, create, a, create an incentive compensation program, or a compensation program, total comp, base, in, uh, short term, long term incentive that is aligned with and drives customer value, financial value, community impact value, and environmental value. So, to what end? And then the second paragraph truly does still stick with the 50th percentile, but also draws out that the total compensation is, in fact, comprised of those three different elements. The base, which is that that allows you uh, for the company to compete with the market. The short term, which drives year over year different results that are building blocks. And the long term, which allows a management team and, and the entire employee base to be long term focused and driving long term value amongst those four different results. Um, and, and then the last is, is structurally how do you create that, and I've kind of talked to this, which is creating a total comp program that is 50th percentile uh, for attraction of the right talent, and then breaking it into those three different sections and making sure that they're aligned with the guiding principles that are now form formal and set in stone with it for the company. Thanks, Aaron. And, and 
share what I'll do in a little bit after after I have Ms. Dykes go through the incentive program is bring a couple motions to action. But um, one of the things that, that Aaron highlighted, which is important, is really understanding where JEA is currently and implementing this short-term and long-term incentive to really, again, tie strategy with total compensation for all employees. So there's there's a, a high level of importance that, that's really going to go into tying all of this stuff together, which will be great. But um, one of the things I'm truly excited about, too, as well as the 5 to 5, uh, that, that I, I believe will start to bring everything together. I am personally a Shark Tank fan, so... Um, that's something that's dear to my heart, but but getting feedback um, from the team members, from employees, um, plays a vital role in, in engaging the workforce. So, um, Ms. Dykes, if you'll take it away for me. Thank you. Uh, our strategy work starts with recognizing that our strategy will not be successful um, if we don't bring our culture with us. Um, in other words, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. Um, mm. And so what we're starting with is some foundational work around culture um, beginning with the guiding principles themselves uh, and the incorporation of, of ideas um, as a core value at JEA. Um, and so how do we incorporate core, uh, ideas as a core value and really lean into those and make sure that we're living our values? Um, what we started with was um, solicitation of ideas, asking employees, um, because frankly, we, um, we truly believe our best ideas are going to come from, in particular, our frontline employees. Um, and when we started asking the question, um, we opened up an ideas at JEA mailbox, and, um, and we got over a thousand ideas, independent ideas submitted from employees. Um, and so the next step in the evolution of this culture change around ideas uh, was the design of a program that we talked about with the compensation committee. Um, and I'm going to skip forward uh, just directly to the five to five page. Thank you. Um, and, um, and this program is designed to accomplish three things. Um, it's designed to empower employees. Um, to not just have ideas, but to make those ideas a reality and to give them a platform to do that. Um, it's designed to, uh, Mr. The, Mr. Chairman, you, you mentioned that you believe incentives drive behavior. I, I agree with that. And so it's designed to drive behavior around ideas, um, to encourage employees to continue to come forward with ideas that can um, make big or small changes in the creation of value for JEA among the four measures of value uh, that were approved in the guiding principles. Um, and, uh, and so it's an important program um, that will allow us to move forward um, with the, the, cu the culture change that we've been talking about. Perhaps the third uh, benefit of this program, and perhaps the most important, is, as Aaron mentioned, the guiding principles aren't a document that, now that they're finished, are just going to go up on a shelf. Mm -hmm. um, it's a document that we are going to live. Um, and this demonstrates from a credibility perspective that we're stepping out of the gate with something that is uh, powerful, powerful from an employee perspective. Um, the program is designed um, to allow employees to submit ideas. Those ideas will get vetted by our black belt team, um, and they'll be vetted for things like uniqueness of the idea, uh, make sure it's not something somebody has already submitted. Um, once that vetting takes place, um, those ideas will be uh, brought forth to all employees who will be given a chance to vote on the ideas. Um, so the black belt team will identify the highest value ideas, but the ideas that move forward will also be uh, the ones that receive the most votes from employees. Um, we'll then take those ideas to uh, what we're calling a Shark Tank setting, um, not using the trademark word Shark Tank, obviously, um, but we'll be, it'll be a committee, um, and I can't thank Board Member Green enough for agreeing to be part of this committee with us. I think that's going to be just tr a tremendous value to our employees, um, where employees will have an opportunity to present those ideas to that committee, um, and then the ones that pass that committee for implementation will come back and receive awards based on the amount of, of value that are created by those ideas that are implemented. Um, so it's an important driver of culture change going forward. Very true. Thank you for that. And again, thank you, Board Member Green, for your participation. I think it's it'll add a tremendous amount of value. Um, what I do want to go ahead and do after that overview is bring a couple of things to motion. I did uh, mention earlier that um, uh, Mr. Zahn is is uh, holding on his contract and, and the like of pulling everything together to make sure everything moves in the right direction. But in that sentiment, I do want to make sure that we address uh, uh, the, the existing term of his contract. Uh, right now, he is, he is currently set for expiration or termination in April. What I'd like to do is actually bring a motion to extend the contract through the end of July. Um, very simple, but while we get everything in order, 
Um, we go through all of our scope of work and research. We also have uh, Towers Willis Watson uh, bless you, giving us uh, feedback as it relates to the compensation landscape. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that we get everyone on the same page. Uh, and, and what I'd like to do is at least bring a motion to extend his term with the same, um, the same language except removing the interim language uh, for his contract through the end of July. Clarification, we've got a, a draft uh, contract at uh, tab six, yes. uh, A4. Is it your motion that we approve the uh, executive contract as amended and presented in the board materials? That is correct, Chair Howard. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Green. Uh, so that's in your board materials. It's got a couple of changes. It does extend the term, yes. uh, as Ms. Johnson ex uh, explained, through uh, July 31. It also adds a uh, board review. Um, requirements so there's an annual review um, component um, and it also has an evergreen uh, renewal I think there was one change in the last page it should say 2018-19 instead of 2017-18 if you'll see that on the very last page um, so with that uh, clarification I'll open it up for discussion Ms. Flanagan could I seek guidance either from Ms. Brooks or Mr. McCarthy in terms of um, how this interacts with our agreement on the search firm and any conclusion therein. And, and Angie's on vacation, so she's not here. Um, the, I need to go back and look at that. The contract was based upon total compensation for the selected applicant um, for the for the role. Um, we could base it upon the, the current existing you know, interim salary that's going to continue through July um, with the idea that we, whatever the salary is set in July, um, make it correct. But I need to go back and review the actual contract with them to understand the timing of the payment um, based upon total compensation package. But that's something on my radar. I just don't have the answer currently to that. So your, your point is their fee is tied to a permit contract mm -hmm. and his compensation. And, and individually, I, I agree with the philosophy of deferring the final contract until it's in line with the overall compensation for the organization. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm just conscious of the existing agreement. It, if it's to the extent that it's possible to, because if I was in their shoes, I'd be concerned about two elements, both the timing and the overall financial accuracy mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And if we can come up with a solution that uh, addresses both of those prongs, I, I think that would be reasonable. I will share, I had a conversation with Kate Furman uh, from our consulting firm uh, this past week uh, who reached out to me and she said they would hold their uh, contract open, not close their project file out until such time as this was resolved. So you might want to follow up with uh, Ms. Furman. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, Reverend Newbill. My understanding is we're still, Aaron is still operating under the interim. Well, we took away the interim name, but name. The other way, but did we do anything else? in every other way, it remains the same except for the extension. Okay, then my concern would be that whenever we do a permanent uh, contract, that it's retroactive. That he's not operating financially as an entity when he is, when he's been selected as a CEO. I, I think that'd be an appropriate uh, motion at the time uh, mm -hmm. that a final contract is presented. Other questions or comments? I have one last thing I do want to bring to motion um, in well, regards. Let's, let's, let's vote. Oh, we do right. Yeah, my apologies. That's my apologies. Right. <laughs> I thought I, we do need to finish yours. Yeah. Make sure okay, we're good no there. No discussion on the uh, amended contract. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then the the compensation uh, uh, policy that we've got up right now. We redlined it. Aaron went through the specifics as it relates to just just reframing the the policy in itself and the language. Again, highlighting um, the the base salary short term uh, incentives with the long term incentive. I, I would like to bring a motion to approve this language um, uh, in the adjustments for what we'll, we'll be looking at moving forward. So I take that as a motion to adopt the revised board policy manual. Policy 2.7 as uh, included in the materials? Yes. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Flanagan. So 
this, these changes, and, and this was a collaborative effort. Um, a lot of people had uh, pen uh, to this paper. Uh, and it basically, as Aaron uh, indicated, uh, revises the current policy uh, to take into account the contemplated total compensation philosophy uh, matching up with our uh, four previously uh, approved uh, measures of corporate value and including within the term total compensation both, both base, short-term incentive, and long-term incentive. That is correct. So, okay, with that introduction, questions or comments? I noticed that this language strikes and volunteers, and I'm just curious for further background in terms of understanding. We don't pay them. We don't at, pay them. <laughs> at, 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 which, at which point we had volunteers, or mm -hmm. do we still, and if so, what scope do they have within the organization? So we certainly have a, a lot of volunteerism of employees out in the community. Um, uh, Melissa, I don't know if you can speak to whether or not I, we don't, on a day-to-day -day basis, utilize volunteers internally in the organization. That's correct. Um, so I, I think it might have been just excessive language back in 2014. Other questions or comments? Reverend Newbill? Thank you. Ms. Green? Ms. Johnson? No. I, I will note that uh, I've asked Jody, and, and I've agreed to undertake this as well, there are probably several places in the uh, board policy manual where we should make reference uh, to the uh, agreed upon four measures of corporate value. Uh, so this isn't the only place uh, where we may be revisiting the board policy manual, but because we're embarking on this total compensation philosophy discussion, I think it's appropriate to make this change at this time. Mr. Zahn? No, and, and just again no. to, to <laughs> yes, sir, uh, uh, to, to remind in terms of timeline and process, um, this will be an agreement on the philosophical uh, foundation upon which to create a total compensation program. Uh, that total compensation program, with Tower Watson's help uh, and the chairwoman's uh, input, would be created between now and April and May, uh, brought back iteratively for the board to review the exact specifics so that the public, the board, all our employees can actually see the construct as it gets created. So this is really just establishing the philosophy around the 50th percentile and the alignment to the, uh, to the guiding principles and the three basic elements that go into total compensation. It's not actually, in fact, paying a bonus or creating the program itself, that program would be created with professional input from compensation professionals. Absolutely. Right. Any other comments, questions, discussion? All in favor of approving these amendments to uh, Board Policy 2.7 in the JA Board Policy Manual so indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Um, anything else, Ms. Johnson? No. Thank, thank you. you and, and thank you for filling in for Mr. Campion. Uh, old business to come before the board. Other new business. Open, yes? Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. My, my, my apologies, but you've got a travel plan for February for the rating agencies, and the, the board is required to approve your travel. Mine? Um, your travel. <laughs> and there's a, there's a, uh, a trip planned in February for the rating okay. agencies that you're going to be attending on behalf of the board as the chair, and we need to get your, your travel approved. Well, then the board will entertain a uh, motion from someone else to approve uh, <laughs> the chair's travel in February. Can I request someone make the motion? So move, no. I, I move that we approve the travel for our chairman in February. February to go to the rating we'll agencies. Radio. Thank you, Reverend yeah. Newell. Is there a second? Yeah. Thank you for the second, Ms. Green. Any questions about that? I have questions. <laughs> uh, no? All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll abstain. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. I was unaware of that. Uh, open discussion. Any uh, topics that uh, other board members want to bring to the group? Your turn is next. Any? No? <coughs> Mr. Zahn. As I understand from uh, Latrice, you have to approve my travel as well. Is that right? <laughs> you just have to sign. I think I just signed that. Okay. And I'll do that. And All right. Need board approval. And I need board approval. <laughs> okay. Commercial only, double, you know. We're done. Uh, anything to add? I know we're running long no. here. Okay. Uh, in terms of the CEO report? Right. Um, I, yeah, I, I do have one, one uh, very big thing. Uh, we had an untimely loss of an employee today. 
mm. and I'm not mm. going to mention their name, um, but I would like to ask for a moment of silence. It, it was not during JE business, but it, it, a loss to our family is a significant thing, and it, and it hurts a lot of our employees. And so I'd just like a, a quick moment of silence. Mm. Okay, we'll take a moment. I'll be brief. A uh, couple of uh, notes. Um, it's uh, with uh, with some sadness that I report that uh, Board Member Hussein Cumber uh, has tendered his resignation from the uh, JA Board effective immediately. Uh, as many of you may know, his wife uh, Leanna uh, did not receive any opposition uh, in her candidacy for uh, City Council uh, to represent District 5 uh, because of uh, potential uh, unintentional conflicts uh, or questions that might arise uh, from Mr. Cumber serving on this board uh, and his uh, wife serving as city council uh, member. He has uh, tendered his resignation. I'd also like to report that uh, our um, fellow board member, Ms. Campion, uh, battling some health issues, is doing much better. Uh, so we're, uh, we're grateful for that news. Um, Ms. Uh, Stewart, can I just ask you, um, I, I know many of us have uh, family, friends, neighbors, uh, certainly JA customers uh, who are federal employees and uh, without any political comments, they're suffering. Uh, so can you briefly summarize the programs available to JEA customers who may be having trouble uh, paying their bills? Sure, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you know, we have a bill management programs such as My Budget, my way payment plans and payment arrangements to help our customers in times of need. Um, all of our customer care associates have been given scripts um, to make sure to be on the lookout for federal employee customers or customers that are imp impacted from the federal shutdown. Um, just very quickly, my budget is one of the advantages there is that it assesses past consumption and levelizes the customer's monthly payment to reduce big fluctuations in their bills, especially <coughs> headed into winter as we are now. Um, my way uh, takes traditional customers with a deposited account and allows them to take that deposit and apply it towards prepaid consumption, but then they would move to a prepaid consumption model. So it allows them to refund their deposit, apply it towards um, consumption, and then go on a prepaid model. Um, we have payment plans available for customers who need just a few extra days to make their payments. And then we have a full payment arrangement plan for those who need more time in paying their past due balance. Um, this allows customers to pay their past due amount over a series of months, so it lets them stretch that out. We also are very close partners with United Way. Um, we encourage our customers to call United Way's 211 if they need rental assistance or food assistance. And then if they were to go to our website, we have a full listing of agencies that we work, th work with throughout the four county service area that um, help with utility assistance, and that is on our website. Thank you, Thank Ms. Stewart. You. I appreciate it. Appreciate if members of the press uh, would, uh, would make a note of that as well so that people are aware of those programs. Um, also like to uh, give a shout out uh, to uh, JEA for its support of uh, Martin Luther King Day yesterday by sponsoring uh, Free Day at the Comer. Uh, I have on good authority that we're over a thousand uh, people who took advantage of that opportunity for a free day at the Comer. Um, and then uh, two last items of note, housekeeping. Uh, after a survey, uh, Latrice informs me that um, we have expressed a preference among the board for earlier board meetings, 9 uh, to 12 as needed. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll change the time of board meetings going forward from 9 a.m. Uh, to noon uh, to give us more time uh, for all this fun stuff that's going on. Uh, and then last but not least, I'd like to ask Ms. Andrews to come up and turn the uh, floor over to Ms. Dykes to introduce the uh, newest member of our uh, senior leadership team, Ms. Andrews. Ms. Dykes? Thank you. I, we are just thrilled to have our new uh, VP and general manager of our energy systems uh, join us. Uh, Karen's got, uh, we just conducted a national search looking for the absolute best candidate that we could find. Um, to fill the big shoes that Mike left behind when he retired. Um, and after an exhaustive national search, um, Karen emerged as a, just an incredible, outstanding candidate. And we are so fortunate that she has agreed to join us here at JEA. Um, she comes from Duke Energy, and I'll turn it over to you if you want to make some comments about your background. But welcome, and I'm thrilled to have you here. Yes, welcome, Ms. Andrews. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I'm very excited to work with this team and the forward thinking and great culture that's here. Um, I have 35 years in the energy industry, so um, I have a long career, but excited about this next phase. 
Well, we're excited to have you here, so thank Thanks. you very much. And I think you've got another uh, announcement uh, of an addition to a, a member of the senior leadership team also. Uh, we do. Um, uh, Julio Agrero uh, will be joining us on February 4th uh, from Quanta Technology as the Chief Innovation and Transformation Officer. Uh, and uh, look forward to introducing him in person when he arrives. Fantastic. Well, many thanks uh, to everyone uh, for being here today and the time that you give to this board. Uh, congratulations, Aaron, on uh, excellent hires. And uh, again, Karen, it's nice to have you here. Thank you. We stand adjourned.